This is the Predator. It is the first weapon you obtain in Mass Effect 3 and it's not considered very good. Can you complete the main story, side missions and DLCs for Mass Effect 3 using only the Predator? For this challenge I will be playing as the soldier, the class focused on getting the absolute most out of your weapon. You have ammo types to deal with all types of defenses and your primary ability grants you a massive damage boost and time dilation. An infiltrator would have also been a good choice and it would have made certain parts of the game even easier. Because I have a zillion playthroughs of Mass Effect 3, I have to choose a bonus power when I am starting the game. I started out with fortification, but I will be experimenting with them throughout the run. Let us set some ground rules for the challenge. Since this playthrough is focused on the Predator pistol, I will not be using abilities that deal direct damage. For the soldier specifically, frag grenades and concussive shots are exempt. Ammo powers are allowed, as they directly buff the Predator. For incendiary ammo, the final fireburst evolution is also a no-go, as the majority of my damage will be coming from the firebirds and not from the Predator. Stasis and cryo powers do affect your enemies, but as long as they don't deal direct damage, they are also allowed. Armor debuffing effects, as long as they don't deal additional damage, are permitted. Squad mate weapon damage must be kept to a minimum. Their damage will not be increased by their skill points or ammo powers. In addition to this, because my grandfather told me to make the most out of my life, while Mr. Buddha told his followers that life is suffering, it is my intent to suffer through this challenge as much as reasonably possible. I will be playing on Insanity and I will start a flesh character from level 1. I will be skipping all the cutscenes as well. You are not watching this and I am not playing this for the plot. Our game begins with Shepard staring out the window like the bitter old man who lives on the third floor. To my great disappointment, it seems that the game defaults using Ashley as the Vermeer survivor on a fresh playthrough. This sucks, because unlike Caden, everything in Ashley's skill tree is dedicated to dealing direct damage or increasing her own damage. Caden's passives can be specced to only give him more survivability and I could have used his barrier and cryoplast abilities without breaking the rules I had said earlier. Giant squids descend from the sky in order to cause the series of events that create the Splatoon universe. In fact, the Reaper signature Braaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaa
But the gun is still fairly accurate when I fire it from cover, so I can still shoot them through their mail slot. Right afterwards, we also run into our first centurions. These guys are essentially assault troopers but with a small amount of shielding. It isn't very strong though and I don't even swap to the disruptor ammo to deal with it. This is also the first time where we run into an issue that I was dreading, the lack of ammo. The Predator is not a very ammo efficient weapon on account of its low damage. This led to a few moments where I had to start headbutting troopers with my pistol. Enemies can occasionally poop ammo on death but that is quite rare and most of the time we will be relying on the predetermined ammo pickups. There is also an odd little bug with Mass Effect 3 Legendary Edition that makes my life a little easier. When enemies are knocked off their feet, they don't sometimes get back up until you damage them again. I played this game a ton on the 360 version and I never encountered this. After stumbling on a Cerberus trooper taking a tactical nap, we finally reached the end. I got the first death of the run as I was dashing to the other side of the room to restock an ammo. The second try went better and Liara Stasis is the real MVP of this mission. We get a call from our trendy high school physics teacher who orders his sextol to steal the data for the protein superweapon. The pleasure bot is disabled and retrieved but Ashley gets injured. We arrive at the Citadel and the council is useless as always. Afterwards I make a brief stop at the Normandy's armory where James beats me up for my lunch money. I have access to a shop that I used to buy two mods for the pistol. The piercing mod which is going to come in very handy and the extended clip which is practically useless to me. I also upgrade the predator to level 5 for a small boost to overall stats. You also start out with a set of Cerberus armor that increases ammo capacity which helps out a lot. Our next stop is Palavin's largest moon, Mini, where we have to rescue the Turian Primark. At the moment we are only going to be facing husks who are not difficult to deal with on their own. The radio tower is fixed and the general apparently has a set of two functioning mounts. For no reason at all, Liara, the most useful squad mate in the game, gets replaced by Karras. Just like with Ashley, every skill and stat boost to Karras either deals direct damage or increases his own weapon damage. Up next, we are going to be facing our first Marauders. Not only are these guys shielded, but they can also buff nearby Reaper troops with armor plating. Thankfully, an armor piercing mod will nullify this. The barricade is getting swarmed by husks. The game expects you to use the machine gun turret, but we have our crappy pea shooter so we don't need to use it. Now here's where things get truly interesting. We have our first armored enemy in the form of the brute. The reapers have decapitated a Turian and shoved its head onto a Krogan, a process I'm sure was quick and painless. Armor reduces incoming damage and if the stats I'm reading are accurate, it will almost nullify the damage of the predator if I didn't have the armor piercing mod I bought earlier. There is also conflicting information on whether or not bosses receive headshot damage, but the most common answer is that they take 40% more damage, however, no further damage is received from headshot bonuses. Once you reach Victus, you are going to be facing several brutes at once, supported by cannibals and marauders. This isn't really an easy fight, especially since we can't use the anti-armor abilities from James or the damage increasing effects of Karras' mine. Surprisingly, I didn't die once here and I had just enough ammo to get by. I also learned that Turians really are so ugly that you cannot even differentiate them from the reaperized ones. I really thought that was Karras. Victus is rescued and Edie gets control of the sex bot. Just like Liara, she receives no gun damage boost from her passive skills and she can also use her decoy and defense matrix abilities. From this point on, I will only be using Liara and Edie as my squad mates, barring the rare few moments where the game forces another squad mate onto you. Rex apparently died from a bus crash and he is replaced by his dickish brother Reeve who demands a cure for the genophage. We land on Sir Kesh and meet up with Mordin, who is not voiced by the same actor as in Mass Effect 2. Cerberus attacks and it's business as usual. I try out Edith's decoy and it sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. As best as I can tell, it works like the infiltrator's cloak. When enemies are currently observing you, it doesn't trick them, they have to be focusing on something else. Sir Kesh is also where we run into the engineers and their pet turrets. Much like the Centurions, they also have shields. They also have a weak spot in the form of the backpack shaped apparatus on their backs that most likely serves the same function as a backpack. 
If you shoot at it enough times, it explodes, and if you have an armor piercing effect, you can actually shoot it through their bodies. Their turrets are not only shielded and armored, but they are also capable of dealing a crap ton of damage if you are caught with their pants down. The shielding on the turrets is strong enough to warrant swapping to disruptor ammo. It took an embarrassingly long amount of time to pick up these spare parts, and I pay my respects to the Raptor, my favorite weapon in the game. Generally speaking, this mission went pretty smoothly, up until the Atlas. These lumbering mountains of shielding and armor are capable of shield gaining you with their accurate mass accelerator cannons and rockets. I am not exactly sure what their weak spot is, but it seems that shooting off pieces of their armor at the shoulders and the dick deals a large amount of extra damage. I got another death here, mainly because I forgot about the extra troopers that spawn alongside it. After the Sir Keshkur puffle, I decided to do the mission on Sanctum, and this is where I started experimenting with different powers and armor pieces. I had increased my damage to the point that it only took 4 headshots to kill Cerberus troopers while under the effect of adrenaline rush. I was taken aback by this to the point where I constantly paused the game to check if I was still playing on insanity. You might even get the impression that the Predator is a good weapon, but keep in mind that using just about anything else would still be faster or more efficient. I swapped out my fortification power with armor piercing ammo, which is a bit redundant given that we already have access to incendiary ammo, but it provided a higher penetrating effect than a piercing mod. I also slapped the scope on the pistol which made headshots easier. It is time to rescue the Primarch's son. Harvesters. I hate them. Up until this point, I haven't had too much trouble, but harvesters seem to change that. Not only can they stagger lock you with their cannons, but they are also armored, and I am pretty sure they have no weak spot. The first one depleted all of my ammo, just so it would stop pounding the Turians. I ran out of ammo again for the second one, before I could even deplete half of its armor bar, so I had to run around like a headless chicken until I found more. I grabbed some poor Turian's chunk, and the third harvester did not approve of this interspecies interaction, as it killed me two times. There is very little ammo in the area, and once it starts focusing on you, it is very difficult to get shots off, even with the time dilation provided by adrenaline rush. Fifteen minutes were spent here, but eventually Shepard's body odor scared it off. Oddly enough, I even managed to save all the Turian soldiers, despite taking far longer to kill the harvesters than I normally would. The final part with the brutes took around ten minutes. This mission just confirmed my biggest fear. Armored enemies were going to cause the most problems. I also buy some fish because I have far too much money. My pistol now has a scope and a cranial trauma mode, and as the Cerberus troopers are being showcased, I can now kill them in only three headshots. After the headshot damage boost from AP ammo, it's almost two shots. Very efficient against lesser enemies, but remember the bosses are unaffected by headshot damage boosts. Later on I started prioritizing ammo capacity and raw damage instead. And in case you were wondering, shielded enemies do indeed take extra damage from headshots while their shields are up. It doesn't make much sense, but here you go. Painting ended with a very lucky death where the last enemy was killed, just as I died so the game still advanced. I checked the memorial board and in this timeline, the collectors apparently turned everyone, apart from Dr. Shakwas, into yogurt. Pain is also dead and I'm not really sure how the fresh save decided on who lived and who died. In the background, I have also been collecting upgrades for Liara's terminal and prioritize weapon damage and power damage, as it seems to affect ammo damage too. On the Tuchanka cannon mission, we meet our first nemesis, who dies before she can even get a shot off. After that, I teach the Cerberus armor, because helmets are for weenies. Cerberus bomb mission. I am pretty sure the explosions at the beginning are just for show and they cannot damage you or your squad. For some reason, enemies also seem to be much tankier this time around, taking roughly two or three extra shots to kill. Regardless, I fought my way to the final atlas. I had used up so much ammo that the ammo pickups either stopped respawning or glitched out so that I couldn't pick them up. For almost ten minutes, I ran around the area, waiting for Edie and Liara to whittle the atlas down with their own predators. It is then that I noticed that I did not have AP ammo active, so I restarted the checkpoint and tried again. The Atlas posed no concern at all, and was taken out in less than two minutes. Iraq and I are up to no good, so Shepard and Bootleg can't go see what's up. No one apparently informed the previous team of Krogan about my challenge run, because they all sacrificed themselves to deliver these flamethrowers to the caves. We encounter our first Ravagers, armored Ragnai corpses that are capable of launching barrages, similar to harvester shots. As is the case with most enemies in the game, on their own they are easy to keep track of, but when combined with other enemy types, as it is right now with the husks, they can overwhelm you. 
I waste far too much ammo popping these reaper pimples, which might explain why it took over 20 minutes to take on the next patch of enemies. I only had 5 shots remaining at the beginning of the checkpoint, and the game didn't provide ammo pickups because you were expected to use the flamethrowers. There was an ammo pickup on the other side of the cavern, but you had almost no cover to reach it. The husks could be pistol whipped one by one, but the gang of cannibals and the ravager were standing next to a barrier generator that would essentially nullify any damage we could do. I used the remaining 5 shots to disable it, and got lucky with the ragdolling glitch after using stasis on the cannibals. This allowed me to run to the other side of the cavern where I finally picked up the precious ammo. This is why thermal clips were a bad idea. I died 4 times here. This is one of those moments where playing as the infiltrator would have made my life a little easier. The battle up until the queen wasn't too bad, as there was still plenty of ammo and cover. The Franken queen is left behind, and Dag dies a peaceful death. Being torn limb from limb, while his screaming torso head containing the last remnant of his consciousness is dissolved in Ragnai acid. Cerberus has nefarious plans for the students at Chrism Academy. I steal some poor kids lunch money to give as a tribute to James, traumatize a teenager for life by murdering two people in front of him, and meet up with Ensign Oliver Swanick, who proves that Jack was erased from existence at some point. The open area after Orion Hall was a bit of a nightmare, as it took over 20 minutes to get through, but that's the case for pretty much any build. Wasn't even due to a lack of ammo, just a large amount of enemies attacking you at once, especially the Atlas on the other side. The final battle was surprisingly easy, given how the game expects you to pilot the Atlas that we left behind. We end up fighting two Atlases, which caught me off guard as I only expected one. If I had to guess, a stray trooper made their way to the one we left behind. Rodriguez stops to pick a penny off the ground, and Ensign Pringle sacrifices himself to bolster the Alliance's funds. Shepard also stops by the Citadel to buy pistol mods, and give a successful interview. Our next stop is Eden Prime, where we recruit a Protean for our mobile intergalactic zoo. More Cerberus cannon fodder, I don't really have much to say. From this point on, unless I specifically mention something, things usually go as follows. Basic enemies go down in a few headshots, while armored enemies take some maneuvering and ammo scrounging. This was the case up until the final atlas, but I had expended so much ammo that the level stopped spawning in more. I couldn't even return to the previous areas to restock. The Atlas had roughly 70% of its armor left when I ran out of ammo, and it was up to Edie and Liara to finish it off. It took them about 8 consecutive minutes to tickle it to death with their predators while they distracted it. Just goes to show how low our squad mate damage is, and how important AP effects are. It is also here where I noticed that squad mates have an unusually high rate of fire with the predator, almost like an SMG. The Krogan refuse to cooperate with the Turians until they are capable of reproduction, so we are off to Tuchanka to cure the Genophage. Because nothing of note really happens up until we reach the Shroud, I'll use this as a moment to talk about the Predator more in depth. Most of its stats range from average to bad. Its weight is low, which means that it really isn't meant to be used as a primary weapon, but rather as something to complement your other damage dealing abilities. But even then you're probably better off using something else. The one other advantage it has is the very fast reloading speed, but that is redundant to us given how Adrenaline Rush instantly reloads our weapon. It is reasonably accurate when you fire it from cover, and is decent for getting consecutive headshots, but overall its status as one of the worst weapons in the game is not undeserved. I also picked up the Kral to annoy the Krogan. And remember to bring it back when you're done. I tried killing the final brutes too, but I ran out of ammo. There are no thermal clip pickups for this area. Because Eve is coughing like a chain smoker, I decide to sabotage the cure for the first time ever. I always do that when Eve is dead and Reeve is in charge. By this point, I had settled with the armor piercing and high caliber barrel mode for my predator, which without any other modifiers is the most damage you can squeeze out of it in a base game. The Omega DLC though has the heavy barrel mode, which provides an even bigger damage increase, and I wanted to see just how far the predator could go. That's right, I started an entire DLC just for a small damage increase. You are now stuck with Arya who only has offensive abilities, but her passives can be upgraded to not affect her gun damage and to give her a large amount of health. I also specced into her capstone skill that gives us more health than shields. The first 20 minutes are all Cerberus, so they are easily disposed of. There is also a large amount of medkits that level us up much faster than I had anticipated. We then encountered the Rampart mechs and I was somewhat dreading this. These guys are fast and armored, but unlike all other armored enemies, they do take bonus headshot damage. And with adrenaline rush, we only need around 6 shots to put them down. They can also deploy a shield, but as with the guardians, AP effects make it moot. 
We are then intercepted by Nairene, a weirdly attractive Turian. Just as with Arya, we can upgrade her passives, so at least my squad is somewhat tanky. She does have a non-damaging skill, Biotic Protector that temporarily makes her immune to damage, but it's so gimmicky that I've never seen anyone get use out of it. I find my first heavy barrel, but it currently deals less damage than the high caliber one. Shepard has also accumulated the necessary number of naughty points to have edgy scars and vampire eyes. Our first phantoms managed to kill me once. They deal a large amount of damage with their hairy palm blasters and can take a ton of punishment to bring down when they are surrounded by their bubble. We reached the Talon outpost, buy upgraded heavy barrels from Mr. Rackhive and head to the area that gives me heavy Dead Space 2 vibes. Just as in Dead Space, an ugly ass zombie thing pops up from out of nowhere and we fight our first adjutant. As if armor wasn't bad enough, they are also surrounded by a pretty hefty barrier. I'm not sure what their weak spot is, but the blue boiled things on their back can be popped in a very satisfying manner, so I will assume that's one of them. We finally get trapped, and Arya attempts to tear the laser walls in new A-hole, while rampant mechs fall down upon us. Shepard apparently has to pick up an Avenger to roll through the hole. We save a ton of people, but more importantly, we find Arya's soggy couch. Is that my couch? I picked up the final rank of adrenaline rush that restores your shields upon activation, and as you can see, it's a literal lifesaver, and it permits me to play more aggressively. As is the case with Cerberus experiments, the adjutants escape, and Irene sacrifices herself so the writers could give Arya a reason to lose her temper and get captured. I expected the final fight at Afterlife to be the same traumatizing experience as the Rachni Caves, but I only died once. I even made use of the shield generator things that I normally destroy. Omega is done. It's not a long DLC if you know what you're doing and skipping cutscenes. Because I already had an EP mode on my pistol, I decided to try out warp ammo. It has a lower armor weakening effect, but a larger damage boost. During our vacation on Omega, server started a coup on the Citadel. This time, it is us who rescues Doc Mitchell. And let me tell you, it is nice to have actually useful squad mates after spending around 4 hours with seat warmers. I got enough XP to max out my health, and watched the Queen of the Reptilians get murdered by someone even edgier than my shepherd. Red eyes and a bad boy attitude don't compare to a katana. The phantoms gave me a bit of trouble during Omega, but with Liara's stasis they aren't even a footnote. And the most noteworthy moment here is Shepard almost getting killed for taking a peek at the women's locker room. Also, if you didn't know, you can shoot the knob things on the hostile elevator to avoid tackling the phantoms. We finally reach Udina, and I'm surprised I was able to talk Ashley down, given our fresh save and generally unpleasant dialogue options. We use our Predator pistol to kill Udina. I hope he gets reincarnated as a tapeworm. Shepard reports Ashley to the Crucible and heads for the Asari Nympho Spa next. Banshees are quite terrifying on your first few playthroughs. They have a ton of armor and barriers. They can insta-kill you at close range. Their warp attack can easily shield gate you and prevent them from recharging. Main thing here is to keep your distance and dodge their warps, and once you get the hang of it, you can focus on other enemies first. Samara is the opposite of not being dead in this run, and is replaced by her sex addict daughter instead. I'm still not sure how the game decides who lived or who died during Mass Effect 2. Jacob and Miranda are alive, they isn't, and Jack or Grunt have seemingly never even existed. The double Banshee fight went surprisingly well since they decided to focus on Liara or Edith's clone. Armor bosses still continue to be a problem, so I specced into squad cryo ammo. This deals no extra damage, but has an armor weakening effect, and can freeze a lesser mob solid. I am running out of loopholes to abuse here, but this is still consistent with the rules I said earlier. I picked up fortification again, and used it to the very end. With our maxed out health and shields, plus the damage reduction from the ability, we are actually quite tanky. Keep in mind that most of the damage resistance only applies when you are in cover so it's not like I can eat Atlas shots. Fortification also provides a power damage boost, which I believe helps out our incendiary and disruptor ammo. The power recharge penalty means literally nothing because of the Predator's low weight. I put the new cryo ammo to the test at the Noveria fighter base and am very pleased with the results. I don't know the exact mathematics on how our pistol piercing and cryo ammo deep of stack, but taking an Atlas down with a final money shot without him restocking once speaks for itself. Emboldened by my success against the Atlas, I start with the Quarian Arc. The Get Threatnode mission forces Tali down upon us. Her passives can be upgraded, and while her sabotage technically deals no damage when you use it against the Get, 
I decided against using it since he pretty much guarantees one of them dying. Tali thanks us for our help by giving us a new gun. I hope not picking up the weapon is a serious insult in Quarian culture. The basic get troops behave like generic Cerberus soldiers, though their heads are a little awkward to hit. The ones with RPGs can be deadly if they don't stick to cover. And the cloaked hunters would be deadly if I hadn't already memorized all of the spawns from the time I played this game on my 360. I thought this was going to go smoothly, up until I freed Knock of Legion and the Get Prime appeared. They are like Banshees and Ravagers rolled into one. They combine the Banshees tankiness and the Ravagers cannons. They can also spawn drones that will force you out of cover. The 20 minutes I spent with the two consecutive Get Primes reminded me of the horrors I experienced within the Rachni cave. This is another area with practically no ammo and the minions refused to drop it as well. To show you how bad it was, I even attempted to melee these guys. After many many tries, I realized that you don't even have to kill them. So I rushed to the exit and relieved my frustration on the sickly key who couldn't fight back. I also did the get server mission, but since there are no enemies to kill, I didn't bother getting the footage. Admiral Koris got his ride impounded by the get, so it is up to us to give him a ride home. We meet the get pyros who only appear in this one mission. They are armor get with a flamethrower, and I do believe they take extra headshot damage. Edie shuts down the AA gun, and the get prime that spawns went better than the dreadnought, but only because there is room to maneuver and pick up ammo. The final sequence has a mounted turret that the get can use, and it is capable of killing you near instantly. They are also bizarrely well protected from stasis and predator shots. The game wants you to use the turret to kill the zillions of get that spawn, but thanks to Liara's stasis bubble, we don't have to. So, rescue Chorus or his crew? I knew that rescuing Chorus would force you to use a turret, and because I had never actually rescued his crew, I thought it would give me an opportunity to use the Predator instead. That was not the case. You still have to use the turret, and neither Chorus or his crew can be the get back on their own. If you discount the heavy melee at the beginning, this is the first time where we couldn't rely on the Predator. There is simply no other way to proceed here. I wanted every single advantage I could get before finishing up Rannoch. I still had ammo powers I hadn't maxed out, so we paused the existential crisis between the flashlight heads and space Romanis to do more side missions. Sion was a standard Reaper cleanup, nothing to say. Because bosses are unaffected by headshot damage boosts, I did something that I had never done. I specced into the ammo capacity evolution over the headshot one. I had already stacked so much damage from my armor pieces and skill points that ammo was just a better choice overall. Chelix is more Cerberus fodder and Jacobs is alive for some reason. Again, nothing really happens here. The only notable thing was the Cerberus soldier stuck on a rooftop. I had to restart the save because the game wouldn't proceed otherwise. Cerberus knew they couldn't match the power of the Predator, so they had to fight 30 using game-breaking glitches. Atlases were no longer scary, even with an engineer repairing one to full health. I invited James and Tally up to my cabin to show them my collection of fish carcasses, and then I started the Leviathan DLC. Reapers are attacking the local Lopotomai community. The only noteworthy thing during this mission was Liara's corpse being claimed by the Void, and someone using Monster Reborn on her. The next mission on the Arid planet is just as uneventful, though I do manage to kill off the last harvester without setting off the explosive barrels that it lands on. Back on the Citadel, James shows up and promises not to beat me up this week as long as I let him keep the husk head. This Poina was also uneventful. The game will not advance until you enter the Triton, but you can just jump back out. I almost killed myself by running into a grenade and eventually met the Proto Squeeds. Back to Rannoch. The game forces your big Tali again, but unlike the Dreadnought, I chose Edie instead. I figured her decoy was going to be more helpful than Stasis. And up next is the reason why I wanted every single advantage I could get. Three get primes, and I had to go into this fight with absolutely no ammo at all. I didn't think there would be any ammo here given how the game gives you three Spitfires, but thankfully there was. Picking Edie over Liara was a good call, as the primes had a tendency to target the decoy. Starting with the leftmost one, I picked the primes off one by one and relocated while they were focused on something else. While it took five minutes and four deployments of Medichel, I didn't even die once here. I really thought this was going to be the hardest fight of the run. To celebrate my victory over the prime triplets, I sentenced the quarry and raised to death. I am already seeing things I haven't seen before, might as well add this to my list. I cannot complete the first fight on Thessia without using the turret. 
I tried several times using only the Predator, but you run out of ammo, and once you reach the nearest ammo pickup, the barrier is already boomed. And for whatever reason, you can't use squad mate powers to help. This might have been doable if I had access to stasis. But I did reach a compromise. The husks were killed with the Predator, while the brutes were turreted. So that's one and a half times where a turret sequence has screwed me over. Other than a single death, the way to the temple was relatively easy. Even with the harvesters pounding on me. But they will eventually just fly off. Kai Leng, as usual, is such a pushover that replacing the depleted batteries on my controller took more effort than beating him. He does use the power of contrived riding to get the Protean VI though. Had Shepard used a Predator in this cutscene instead of the Avenger, we would already have the Catalyst. After a generic battle on Ontaro, I head for Horizon. My damage with the Predator has reached a point where Phantoms are now 7 shot kills, if you can hit them in the head. Still here at Gary's shoe store because, quite frankly, I have a mortgage to pay. That's Miranda. Well, Bob, this is Miranda Veracruz Hoya Cardinal. Well, this past week there have been two fires, a flood, and a mass murder. Unfortunately, none of them here at Gary's shoes. The hallway with the Ravagers can be tricky, and I thought it would be, but this time around they decided to come to us, which I have never seen before. This, along with Edith's decoy, allowed me to run to the next room to stock up on thermal clips. It appears to be local hooligan Al Bundy! Damn it. I hope she's ready for The final battle with the Panches and Brutes also went well. It seems that shooting brutes in the ass seems to mitigate the armor somewhat. And given how they have a tendency to cover their face, it is easier to hit. Even multiple armored enemies at once are not as scary as they used to be. Miranda? Miranda, I'm sorry. This is Miranda Veracruz de la Hoya Cardinal <laughs> saying goodnight and yikes. Come on, Mariana. Let's get you out of here. While millions of humans and aliens are going through unimaginable hell, Shepard decides to obtain nutrients at a fancy sushi restaurant. Turns out we sat at the wrong table, and someone sends an entire platoon of mercenaries to kill us for that. You are forced to use the suppressor instead of the predator, but it is very easy to skip the Cat 6 mercs with adrenaline rush. I was curious who would show up to save me since Rex was dead, and turns out it was James, who hated the thought of someone other than him harassing me for my money. You get a thousand round Spitfire that we use to fire on passing cars until we are rescued. To thank him for saving me, and possibly as a method to prevent further lunch money extortions, I took James on a date. There is no combat here, and I don't even know why I recorded this. The camera was also intent on focusing on Shepard's ass for whatever reason during conversations. Finally, actual combat with the Predator. Cat 6 mercs are essentially Cerberus troops, but with shields. They can deploy a very annoying drone that will shield gate you, and they are also capable of throwing cluster grenades. Turns out the table at the sushi restaurant was reserved for Shepard's clone, which explains why we were given the seat instead of him. The renegade interrupt lets you use a predator, so naturally we are going to take it. Cat 6 heavies are armored guardians, though their shields cannot be pierced with AP mods, or if they can, the damage is severely reduced. Normally, you could disable them with overload, but that is a damage shielding ability. So we just have to get accurate shots through their mail slots, or wait until they are distracted by Edith's clone. The heavies seem to be especially susceptible to the decoy, and they don't seem to notice me putting rounds into their heads. I actually had to do the Normandy and clone fight twice because he forgot to record the first time. The clone Shepard Soldier can use both Inferno grenades and Carnage, something the player cannot. He is also using the N7 Valkyrie instead of the Predator, so there is no way his plan could have worked. Everyone in the galaxy already knows the real Shepard will never use an actually good weapon. The clone will almost always focus on you, and if he gets within melee range, you are forced to do a QTE. He is also supported by Cat 6 Mercs, and Brooks who can turn invisible. After three attempts, the clone is sent flying, and Brooks is killed with the Predator. I wanted to do all the Armex Arsenal challenges too. I hit a snag for the challenge where you are required to have two alliance squadmates. So maybe I shouldn't have sent Ashley to the crucible to peel potatoes. The only squadmate I could buy is Jacob, and while he did serve in the alliance, he didn't count. The idea of achieving max score with the Predator is about as appealing as our national food. 
and while I did attempt it for several hours, I did not succeed. And the most I was able to get was 6010 points, which was enough for a gold medal. The final attack on the Cerberus base. The hangar fight was pretty easy. For me, not for Liara, who became the favorite squeeze for the first Atlas and was incapacitated four times in only two minutes. I did run out of ammo by the Proto Reaper, so I skipped past the enemies. I found ammo along the way and then came back to finish them off. I also tripped over this phantom who was affected by the stasis glitch. Because she turned invisible, no one saw her. And she must have been like this for at least four minutes. Kai Lang, the elusive man's top agent and Shepard's big bad replacement, gets killed by the weakest weapon in the game. Kai is also a female name in Estonian, so that adds even more humiliation value. The Reapers have taken the Citadel to Earth. Up until we get rid of the cannon, the screen will shake periodically, which causes me to waste a lot of ammo. You have to destroy the Reaper with the cane, but it's a piece of scenery, so you're not technically dealing damage with it. I wasn't sure how the first Banshee fight was going to go, since I usually spawn camp her with the second cane, but it went well. Especially now that the screen wasn't shaking half the time. Edie's decoy isn't just something for the enemies to ogle at, but it's also capable of blocking Banshee blasts. We meet up with the man who gave us our predator to give him the bad news about how we failed the run on account of the turret sequences. As a response to that, Anderson shoves us onto another turret. But thankfully you don't have to shoot anything and the game will progress all on its own. I'm not even sure what the point of this sequence is if there is no chance of failure. Might as well be a cutscene. The final assault begins. A harvester shows up and disables the accompanying Mako, but gets killed with half of my ammo to spare. Remember that the first ones we killed took all the ammo we could carry at the very least. The combination of our Predator's AP and Heavy Barrel mods, Squad Cryo ammo and our own incendiary ammo is most definitely pulling its weight. I had almost earned enough XP to reach level 60 and if Liara didn't have oceans of medicel flowing through her system, we would already be there. I get my revenge on the crabby guy and start the last proper battle of the game. Every reaper unit, with the exception of ravagers, will come in waves, each more difficult than the last. The first wave of husks, marauders and cannibals goes down without much issue, as you would no doubt expect by now. Though I'm not really sure what happened to Liara here. Her icon was greyed out, she wouldn't use her stasis and just stood in one place, menacingly. Maybe it's a side effect of all that medicel that Shepard has been stuffing inside of her. She snapped out of it when the second wave of Reaper mooks temporarily shuffled her from her mortal coil and I was able to revive her. Two banshees appear shortly after, but even they go down quick. With the incendiary ammo, we can use our predator to take out four bars of health from a banshee during a single adrenaline rush. So much damage. Just imagine if we could use an actually decent weapon, like a Harrier, Typhoon, Black Widow or German swear words. The third wave starts with four brutes attacking all at once from the cardinal directions. Eventually, a harvester will show up, and after that's taken care of, two banshees attempt to get revenge for the ones we disposed of earlier. It is also here when the destroyer in the background starts shooting the area with its instagill beam, creating another hazard for you to be aware of. The ammo pickups in the southernmost area have stopped spawning. The game did allow me to fire the remaining missiles and end this battle, but the Predator still thirsts for blood. I found more clips at the launch computer and tried to finish off the Banshees, but chickened out. It took like 10 deployments of Medigel, but I was able to complete this sequence without any deaths at all. There's a recurring theme in this run, where the fights I initially perceived to be the hardest go smoothly. This is it, the final run. Harbinger realizes that having just one destroyer guard the only way to access the Citadel was dumb and personally descends from the heavens to smite our asses. Though he is gracious enough to allow the Normandy to land in plain view for 45 seconds so that Edie and Liara could escape. Shepard gets blasted and Harbinger decides to leave the lift undefended, though no one in the Alliance seems to notice that. Holy shit, Shepard is still alive. He stands up, marches on and uses his... Carnifex! There are countless times the game gives Shepard a predator in cutscenes or other special moments, and now he is given a Carnifex instead. I had nothing other than a predator in my loadout and I didn't even pick up the Carnifex on Jellix. 
we have no choice but to use it against the three husk hilts and marauder shields to go forward. Anderson somehow also makes it to the citadel and the elusive man had already set the table for us. To add more insult to injury, he forces me to shoot Anderson with a carnifex while he takes Anderson's predator for himself. I couldn't use the special dialogue options, so I had to use the carnifex for the final time to kill Tim and prevent a mission failure. Because I didn't feel like watching the extended cut epilogue, I told the catalyst to go pluck itself and condemn the entire galaxy to a fate worse than death. And that was Mass Effect 3, on Insanity, with all of its DLCs and most side missions completed, using only the Predator. I had a lot of fun optimizing this run, between ammo capacity, damage, headshot boosts and survivability. It goes to show just how flexible Mass Effect 3's gameplay is, if you can make something like the Predator work. I will probably upload some full clips from the gameplay too, since I couldn't show everything in the video. I hope you enjoyed watching the video, and more importantly, I hope you gain some more appreciation for Mass Effect 3. Please don't touch that. As I said, Commander, don't touch that. Again, I would ask you to refrain from touching that. Perhaps don't touch that means something different in your language. I would rather not refer this matter to the human embassy. Touch it all you want. You'll never find out. What it does. Are humans really so deprived of stimulus that they must insist on touching everything? I'm afraid if you keep touching that, you risk a diplomatic incident. Further manipulation of that object is grounds for further admonishment. Really? You must stop touching that! Once more, the Solarian Union formally requests that you not touch that. Fine, if you are so enamored of that object, then I suggest you get your own feces analyzer.